The last time we heard from Nate Henley was when he was promoting his 2022 book, The Beetle Bandit, a serial bank robber's deadly heist, a cross-country manhunt, and the insanity plea that shook a nation. The author of more than a dozen books, Henley is now turning from true crime to war crime for his latest book. Today, he's here to talk about atrocity on the Atlantic, attack on a hospital ship during the Great War. Uh, most of your previous books have focused on crime and criminals. Uh, what inspired you to write uh, this book? Well, I've always been sort of personally interested in history in general and military history in specific. I was sort of poking around for a new topic to write about. And I was actually looking for something to write about for the uh, website of TV Ontario. I do some historic pieces for them. Came across this reference online to the Leipzig war crime trials. I'm familiar with military history, as mentioned. I've never heard of this. Read on and was astonished to discover that this war crime trial, uh, one of the main cases involved a Canadian hospital ship, the Landover Castle. So I just thought that really sounds like a fascinating subject. And it does sort of have, you know, there is sort of a, I don't know if you would call it true crime, but as you said, war crime element. There's a major court case, there's prosecutions, there's precedents. So it's not too far afield from what I've been doing previously, but I just decided to branch out a little bit. Now, as you mentioned, the, the sinking of uh, HMHS Landori Castle was mm -hmm. a war crime that appalled the world, but then it was largely forgotten. Little known, I've yes. heard of it. You'd never heard of it, yet we've all heard of the sinking of the Lusitania, for example. Yes, yes. So how did this happen? How did this get forgotten? Um, well, actually, you uh, cited one of the reasons. Uh, the Lusitania, British passenger liner with American passengers, was sunk fairly early in the war, May 1915. So the Allies had years and years to turn this into, a, you know, an example of um, German barbarity in their propaganda. Landover Castle was torpedoed uh, June 27, 1918, and the war ended before the year was over. So they only had a few months to use this for propaganda. Uh, there were a few other reasons. There was a subsequent war crimes trial. People felt it ended very dismally. And there's something what I call tragedy overload, that humans can only process so much misery and horror. So in that regard, the Halifax explosion became the wartime tragedy that Canadians remember. And there is an element of heroism in that, you know, assistance poured into the city, the city was rebuilt. Uh, so that became the tragedy Canadians remember. Landover Castle, there's very little glory or gain. The main perpetrators didn't seem to get punished very harshly. Uh, it just seemed like a very sad, dismal story involving a lot of death and horror. And just simply by the 20, 1920s, the Canadian public was really eager to move on for the Great War, that this has been such a long slog, such a slaughter. 66,000 soldiers from Canada and Newfoundland have been killed, mostly young men. We're talking guys late teens, early 20s, countless others horribly injured, you know, wheelchairs for life or missing limbs, missing their face, blind. And the Canadian public really was like, OK, we're proud we did this, but let's move on. We've got other things. We're going to commemorate victories like Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele and forget about the horrific stuff that went along with it. So for a variety of reasons I talk about in my book, this really sort of got swept aside and forgotten. There's what they call, and you refer to it as well, and I've, I've read this elsewhere, a, a tidying up of the history after the war. Yes. And this seems to be another example of that. Very much so. Um, as I said, it's a sad, terrible story. Um, hospital ships sunk. And at first, there seemed to be very little sort of, as I said, glory or gain from this, that obviously the um, the survivors, there are 24 people in a single lifeboat who survived this ambush. Obviously, they, you know, were quite brave and you know heroic to do this. But it didn't fit the sort of military narrative, this sort of neat sort of military narrative of our brave boys charging up the hill with bayonets. It was this sort of murky, unpleasant story. And the outcome, at least in the 1920s, as far as people could tell, was quite dismal that it, it got taken to a war crimes trial. Um, 
two lieutenants from the submarine were given four-year sentences, which was considered a joke, and then they were busted out of jail by their comrades. So that was even worse. So it, it was regarded as like a humiliation, really. And, you know, a terrible tragedy, but, you know, we didn't really um, gain anything from this. It was just this awful loss of life. And, um, you know, let's sort of move on. Now, now, getting into the meat of the thing, the land of Recastle was a hospital mm -hmm. ship sunk by mm -hmm. a German U-boat off the Irish coast on June 27th of 1918. And there was no mistaking the ship for anything else. Well lit, Correct. clearly marked. The Central Powers even had a list of these hospital ships, yep. and the Landovery Castle was on it. So this was clearly a choice. Mm -hmm. for this. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I didn't realize before I did my book, there was a series of treaties before the First World War, the Hague Conventions. Everyone's familiar with the Geneva Conventions. Well, there were treaties before then. And under the Hague Conventions, it clearly stated you are not allowed to attack hospital ships. You can stop them, you can board them, search them, you can't sink them. And in exchange, a hospital ship has to be painted bright white with a big green stripe along the side, big red crosses, has to be brightly lit at night. So you have to, like, as opposed to trying to camouflage yourself, you have to be as brightly lit as possible. You're, the name of the ship is passed to the enemy. And you're not allowed to carry munitions, armed soldiers, or any weaponry. And the Landover Castle was abiding by all this. The German Imperial Navy was convinced that the Allies were abusing hospital ships, that they were using them to transport munitions, soldiers. And one of the shocking things, that I did not know this, 1917, the Germans resume what's called unrestricted submarine warfare. They can sink any merchant ship without warning. They also permitted their subs, their U-boats, to attack hospital ships, but only in certain areas. That was it was one of these very weird kind of things. Like, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea and the sort of uh, this this maritime zone, as they described it, the English Channel to the North Sea, it was okay to attack hospital ships there. Landover Castle wasn't anywhere near those areas, but they attacked it anyway. The U-boat crew later even testified they could tell by the lights of the ship that it was a hospital ship. The commander of the U-boat, Helmut Patzig, felt it was a legitimate target, and they interrogated survivors, and they were just convinced that it had American pilots on board. And there's some speculation that German spies might have given them some bad information, but it fed into that the, the U-boat crews by this point in the war were really paranoid. Um and they just they sunk it knowing full well that it was on a medical mission 258 people on board including mm -hmm. 15 uh nursing sisters as yes. they called at the time uh mm -hmm. how was news of the sinking received at home and abroad it was a, a global shock that even in the midst of this brutal brutal war and this is a war that we've seen gas you know gas warfare uh, staggering deaths um, the death tolls are just unbelievable. The very first day of the Battle of the Somme, the British Army lost nearly 20,000 dead in a single day, including a large contingent, by the way. There was a Newfoundland contingent that was just destroyed. But even in the midst of this, this incident shocked the world. There were headlines from all over, from Australia, United States, um, all sorts of sort of cries for vengeance, and I think there was a couple elements here that, number one, it was a hospital ship. And the, the whole element of these nurses being brutally killed and the lifeboats being shelled by the submarine. The submarine tried to, you know, commander tried to cover up his war crime by killing the survivors. And this to people just, it just shocked them. And there was this sort of, at the time, nurses had this exalted role that this is a very you know, much more sexist time, but nurses had this sort of special privileged status that they were the exemplars of uh, self-sacrifice and they were considered just sort of like uh, the, you know, a paragon of heroism. And so the notion that 14 nurses were just brutally killed in this attack just was appalling. Um, so that was another reason I was surprised it was forgotten that it just really I was looking up newspapers and just headline after headline 
Great Britain, Canada, United States, Australia, just shocked headlines saying that this is, you know, just beyond the pale. Now, uh, two other important things that come out of this are two very important legal precedents that come out. Yes. An order cannot absolve a subordinate from guilt and international measures are by which wars should be fought. And yes, Castle helped establish both of these to yes. the day. That's correct. That um, a lot of these principles, uh, when we talk about war crimes or international law, a lot of people don't know the origins of this and the origins. A lot of this came out of the what was called the Leipzig war crime trials. These were trials after the First World War and um, they adjudicated in Germany at Leipzig by the Supreme Court. And one of the cases they heard was the Landover Castle. And the court focused on mostly the shelling of the lifeboats. It had kind of ignored the whole torpedoing of the ship in the first place, but shelling of the lifeboats. And it found two subordinates guilty. And as you mentioned, uh, it, it set two precedents. It said uh, international uh, law is sort of the standard you have to go by. And number two, um, just because you're following orders that does not absolve you of guilt. And these principles became incredibly important in, after World War II, that both these principles guided war crime trials of Nazi defendants, because Nazi defendants had two main sort of um, defenses that they said, well, we're just following orders and international law didn't apply in Hitler's Germany. And prosecutor after prosecutor said, no, 1921, a German court said the following and the line um the firing on the boats was an offense against the law of nations that's a wonderful line that the leipzig court said and they repeatedly cited the leipzig um the landover castle precedent to slap down this defense and that became an established thing um there's an established principle now in wartime that if you're a soldier and your commander says i want you to go machine gun um these you know civilians lying on the ground, that is considered an illegal order. And you do have the right to disobey it. And uh, if you do obey that, then you yourself might be culpable for committing crime, for committing murder. Now, as we've talked about, um, it was a big deal at the time, but then the sinking of the Landover Castle became uh, largely forgotten over the years. Yes. Um, but now in recent years, that is changing. And uh, yes. one of the more interesting parts of the book towards the end is you talk about uh, an opera based on correct? The... Yes, correct. Um, there has been some recent attempts to bring back attention to the Landover Castle. Uh, there's a couple of recent books, um, some of which I recommend very strongly in uh, my sources, uh, focused on the nurses who are on the Landover Castle. Uh, you can look them up. They're very, very good if you want details about what the nursing sisters went through. And uh, Stephanie Martin and Paul Chufo put together this wonderful opera to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the sinking. I go into detail about the genesis of this opera, but it basically started when Stephanie Martin, who is a composer, was in a church doing rehearsals for a different sort of musical thing. And she noticed a plaque on the wall of this church to um, Agnes uh, Mackenzie, uh, who was died on the Landover Castle when it was torpedoed. She was like, what? I've never heard of this. And she said she was familiar with history like me, but had never heard of this. Looks into it, was shocked, and just thought, what a great way to sort of commemorate the 100th anniversary that I, you know, she could write a musical. So there's been a production of it. And uh, there were two productions. There was a sort of bare bones production in Toronto uh, with the, I believe they're called... Uh, Bicycle Opera, and then there was a more full production at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario, did a full costume production with, you know, stage effects and costumes, etc. And they put it on right before the COVID uh, clamped down. So February, March 2020. And you can actually see a dress rehearsal online. So you can actually go to YouTube and look this up and watch it. It's quite poignant, quite remarkable, fantastic way to commemorate this. I hope efforts like this, like my book, the opera, these books about the nurses, I hope this brings back attention to this sort of forgotten tragedy and the incredible important role it played that, you know, we 234 people lost their lives on this ship, British crew, Canadian medical staff, and their lives 
lent itself, their deaths lent itself to this incredibly important uh, court rulings that have hopefully saved lives since then. What do you hope people get out of the book? Uh, a couple things. I hope, first of all, they just simply remember uh, this important part of Canadian military history, that this is sort of a largely forgotten aspect of our own history. Canadians are a bit notorious or sometimes neglecting our own history. And the incredible influence it had on, as I said, the legal system, international law and war crime prosecutions. We are very familiar with the Nuremberg trials and the notion of just following orders is not a defense. That's very well established. People know that. They don't know where does that ruling come from. And it comes from the Leipzig trial. And the very third thing is just simply, I hope people remember this is a human story. I really tried to focus on uh, certain figures on the ship, including Major Thomas Lyon, who's from Vancouver and was one of the very few Canadian survivors and then subsequently testified in Leipzig. I hope to bring back their memories that these, you know, they did not die in vain, to use a cliche. And the handful of survivors, um, some of them went on. I interviewed the grandson of one of the survivors, and he just talked about how his grandfather was a very quiet, decent man, never talked about his experiences um, with the Landover Castle, but did his part in the war. And I really hope that people read this and remember some of the sacrifice that uh, many of these people went through. The name of the book is Atrocity on the Atlantic, Attack on a Hospital Ship During the Great War. It's available from Dundurn Press. My thanks to author Nate Henley. Thank you, John. Really appreciate this opportunity.